Hello and welcome to today's, today's webinar, Clinical Applications for Near Infrared Technology, hosted by Sarah Chapman from Christie Medical. Please be aware that this webinar will be recorded and we will make the recording available on our website shortly after the conclusion of today's event. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A functionality within Microsoft Teams and we will do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the webinar. If you would like to contact us after, we would be delighted to hear from you and we will display our contact details at the end of the webinar. Without any further delay, I would like to hand over to Sarah to start the webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sarah Chapman. Firstly, I'd like to thank Griner Bio One for hosting today and for inviting me to partake in this webinar. I feel very honored, so thank you, Nick. Today, we will be speaking about near infrared technologies and three different clinical applications. First, we'll cover using near infrared technology and neonatal ICU pediatric patients. Then we'll move into blood donation and near infrared advantages. And finally, we will end with modernizing aesthetic procedures using near infrared technology. My disclosures, I am a registered nurse specializing in vascular access, neonatology and pediatrics. I am a paid employee of Christie Medical Holdings and I have no other conflicts. So first, let's talk about neonates and pediatrics, our tiniest of fragile patients that you'll find in any given hospital. The neonatal de department is a very interesting, uh, very niche, unique area of a hospital. This is an area of the hospital where we have a very long patient stay typically. So currently, the neonatal environment looks a little bit like this. Um, the babies in this department typically undergo anywhere between 10 to 15 painful procedures per day. Many of these include needle experiences. The problem is, is that neonates have an underdeveloped uh, neurosensors, and so they're intensity for pain is actually greater than us as adults and even children. Their synapses aren't quite formed and so pain to neonates uh, is actually higher, that threshold is higher than our normal average adults. The exposure to this repeated painful stimuli unfortunately does uh, influence their brain development and higher stimuli to pain with multiple insults can actually result in long-term physiologic and behavioral uh, issues later in their life. Like I said earlier, this is an area where many of the babies stay for a very long amount of time. If you have a premature baby, they will typically stay anywhere up to three to four to five to six months, depending on their illness. And in addition, you know, babies, neonates especially, they only have a few layers of skin, whereas adults, we have seven. They only have, they have underdeveloped, their whole entire systems are underdeveloped. So they have underdeveloped skin, as well as tiny, thin, very, very fragile, fragile veins. If any of you have worked in a NICU, sometimes I feel like the veins just looking at a needle, they tend to, um, they tend to burst when you get near them with a needle. We do try to avoid any type of situation that could increase the baby's risk for infection, and this also includes unneeded pick lines or central lines. Certainly, neonates need their central lines for clinical care, but we do try to avoid putting in <clears throat> uh, different types of central lines if the, if the baby doesn't need it, just so we can avoid infection as their, their immune systems are also underdeveloped. The long-term infusions, however, if you're staying in the hospital, if your baby is in the hospital for three months, you will need, that child will need long-term infusions of some sort. So searching for the optimal vein that will accommodate the type of device that we're putting in is actually critical. We don't want to re be restarting pick lines and peripheral IVs uh, off, you know, over and over because they do have very limited vascular real estate. So we're working with very tiny children with very limited places where we can put IV lines. So how can we kind of change this current environment, specifically using near-infrared? <clears throat> well, with the babies, near-infrared devices such as Christy Vein Viewer, they do assess veins up to 15 millimeters deep, as well as hematomas down to 15 millimeters deep. 
if you can imagine a premature baby, 10 millimeters is sometimes, um, you know, the whole width of their wrist. So you can see a lot of these vessels from head to toe on the infants. The nice thing about VeinViewer is it's a smart device, and so it actually gives you almost like a real live action movie of what's happening underneath the baby's skin. So you can actually assess real-time blood flow, which allows you to assess valves and bifurcations. I can avoid those structures in order to have longer dwell times on my IV lines. Because these babies are typically so small, we actually can use this to assist in putting in pick lines. I personally have put in pick lines on neonates using vein viewer. Uh, so this can be used not only for peripheral, but also different types of central lines. We want to obviously decrease how many times we're sticking these babies. And so the uh, near infrared allows us for faster access as well because we're and, and less exposure time to the patient uh, as far as manipulating the baby around. You can quickly assess and find the best vein, not just any vein. So I realize that in neonates, we can see the veins with our naked eye many, many times but we aren't able to see inside the vein. What's the actual vein doing and where does it go when it goes deeper into the baby's body? And this is a device that can actually help us pick the best vein, not just be desperate for any vein. This is a tool that obviously is very helpful with better clinical outcomes for our neonates, but also the parents. This is an area of the hospital where the parents are quite involved with the child's care. And I like knowing that I've used every tool in my arsenal to help decrease the amount of pain that's inflicted on someone's baby. So a lot of families are quite happy when you pull this out because you're trying everything you can to be the best clinician that you can for that baby. And this device is completely safe to use on these tiny uh, children, tiny babies. This uses a pure near infrared process. There's no heat or radiation em emitted. So it's safe to use from head to toe on these babies. So I'd like to take you through a quick case study that was just recently done about eight months ago in South Africa. This is a hospital called Tembisa, and they, we went ahead and we wanted to do a case study looking at their outcomes for peripheral IV access over a 72 hour period. So a very short time, time frame. I'd like to show you a, a brief video clip of one of the doctors there and her experience and what an actual assessment would look like on a neonate and what an assessment would look like on a neonate that has had multiple punctures prior, who is actually a difficult venous access patient. Now, I will warn you, the baby is it's a little bit, uh, the sound is a little bit uh, loud because the baby is crying, but you can clearly see and hear what the doctor is saying. This one looks like it was punctured. This one is a baby that looks like it was punctured. Yeah. And there's another one here that we can attempt. So what made you decide to use that particular vein? Because it's more clear on the vein finder and then the other ones look like that, they've been punctured Punctured, before. yes, yeah. I can see, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's very, this one is clear to okay. see under the vein finder. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here we can see, there's this one here that we can see. And then there's this one here as well that we can use. You okay. can decide to use this one. This one looks like it this was punctured. This one looks punctured. like it might have been punctured. Yeah, yes. but I think we can still use it okay. as well. And, and would you look anywhere else? Yeah, on the head we can see that there's this one, and then there's this one. That's, there's so what sort of things there. are you looking? You're looking for things like valves and yeah. So you can see um, with the vein view if it's been damaged and where there are valves. Yeah. <laughs> How would you know? Do you flush or would you know that you're definitely in the vein? You can see with the back flow and then you do flush to see if you are in the vein. Okay. So, yeah, you have any infiltrated tissues. Okay. Yeah. Would there be any reason why you wouldn't maybe try on the little foot or even on the... No, we can try. You can try anywhere where there's a vein. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mukachwa. So after three days at this particular Tembisa hospital, they decided to use the vein viewer on <clears throat> all of their neonates, of which 81% of these were considered diva patients, which is difficult 
IV access patients. And after just three days use, they found that in 100% of the infants, they could clearly map the veins. And in 100% of the infants, they could assess the actual vein health and viability, which is important. That's It's not just finding the vein, but it's actually assessing the vein health and is it viable to accommodate a catheter. The number of staff needed to start an IV on average was 1.06. As you know, in any pediatric setting, sometimes it takes two or three nurses or clinicians to start an IV. The average time um, to start an IV was less than 15 minutes in 88% of the cases. And in just these three days, their average stick rate dropped down to only 1.8 sticks per baby. So we did tell this hospital, if this is just a three day case study, can you imagine if you use this on every patient every time in your NICU? So a couple of tips and tricks. So I'm going to give you my list of tips and tricks for using vein viewer on neonates because neonates definitely are different than adults and they're a lot more difficult to start those IVs or draw blood on. So you always want to use with the vein viewer, there's different modes and you always want to use something that we call the fine detail mode. Fine detail does just that. It gives you all of the detail of the very fine tiny structures. This is an optional button to use. It's not always helpful on adults, but is a must do if you're going to use this on your neonates. I always get asked about extra fluffy babies, right? So a lot of babies are born with what we call brown fat. It's a lot thicker and denser, and it a lot of times it compresses the veins underneath it. It can make it a little bit tricky to find a vein through very chubby babies. However, there's always access points on a baby's body where the veins come closer to the surface where they might be easier to see with the vein viewer. So I always look inside their creases, inside the ankles, inside the antecubital to see if I can track the vein to a place where it might accommodate a needle. So open up those rolls of fat and many times you can see a glimpse of a vein. Please do not change your normal technique. This is a device that is made to be an adjunct to your current practice. So if you still, if you tourniquet or if you put a warm compress, please continue to do these things because your best practice is your best practice. So we're not asking you to change what you're doing. We're asking you to integrate technology that's been around for 14 years that is rooted in evidence to integrate this into your department and into your procedures. You. I think one of my, my favorite tips and tricks is you don't actually have to use the light to guide you into the vein. It's certainly helpful because you can see your vein in response to your needle. You will not be able to see your needle because your needle is not made of blood and near infrared just likes blood. But you can see your vein in response to your needle. So if it's rolling around or if you're on the left hand or right hand side of it, you will be able to see these things if you use the light. However, Babies move a lot when you try to start their IV and they are wiggly little humans. And so sometimes the light can actually be distracting because it's it's essentially a digital projection down onto the skin, as you saw from the video. So sometimes the light can actually be distracting. So many times, even myself, I use the vein viewer to map, assess and choose my best vein option. And then I turn the light off because then at least I know 100% certainty I'm going for a viable vein that should accommodate my needle. So I know that there's something underneath the skin. Now it's my responsibility as the clinician to get the needle in, right? So remember the vein viewer is not a uh, vein starter, it is a vein viewer. So we are still responsible for having good practice to put in these catheters. Make sure that you're proficient at using this technology before you start sticking Diva neonates. So please, if you're going to start integrating this into your practice, do not wait for a month and you've never touched the device, you've never used it, and you've already stuck a baby a few times and then you say, oh, let's go grab that vein viewer that lady showed me a month ago. You're probably going to fail and that's not because of the device and it's not usually because of your technique. It's because you haven't used the technology. So I equate this to snowboarding. So I'm a big snowboarder in the winter and if you've never been and I take you to the mountains and I drag you to the top of the Alps and I throw a board on your feet and I say, good luck, 
I'll meet you at the bottom. You could probably get very, very hurt. That's not the best way to learn something. I'm going to put you on the bunny hill or the children's hill first, so you get used to that board on your feet. Same thing with the device. Please integrate it in to more, I would say, easier situations or easier blood draws, just so you get used to using a near infrared light technology. Um, please shine the light directly down onto the patient's skin. A lot of the isolates and incubators have a UV coating on them and it can interfere with the projection. You might want to use our image cropping to, um, mode as well. So we actually have the field of view. You can actually crop it like you would a picture in Photoshop, small, medium and large. So depending on the patient's anatomy you're looking at, you might want to actually use the smaller window. And finally, the probably the biggest thing I can tell you, and if you haven't listened to anything so far, please listen to this part, is that if you use the vein viewer on anybody, but namely neonates, and you don't see a vein, there really isn't a vein there. So remember, this device every single time picks up veins down to 10 millimeters deep. If you use the device and you don't see a vein, there is not a vein there within 10 millimeters deep. So please, please do not blindly stick the baby and say this technology isn't working. There has to be something there. If there's nothing there, there's nothing there, which is such a valuable assessment as well. So it's tempting to say, oh, this doesn't work. I'm not seeing any veins. But what it's showing you is there aren't any veins viable. Please do not stick this baby three or four times. Move on to a different type of adjunct technology, maybe ultrasound. Um, to go ahead and get a successful IV catheter. All right, let's move on to a different, you know, different cohort of people, and that would be our blood, our blood donors. So let's look at the current environment. Again, the current environment of blood donation across the EU. 90, according to the um, World Health Organization, the EU World Health Organization, 90% of people that are eligible to donate blood are actually not currently doing so. On average across the EU, we have a big average depending on the region we're talking about, anywhere between six to 67 out of 1,000 inhabitants are actually donating. However, again, according to the WHO, each country actually needs 20 to 25 donors per 1,000 to maintain their national blood supply. So we, this is an area that's very unique in that we rely on vol, people volunteering to walk in the doors and donate blood or plasma of their own volition. They aren't forced to come in as they are you know, in a hospital laboratory blood draw situation, right? These are voluntary people walking in we also need volunteer people walking in that have viable, healthy blood that we can use. Not everybody can also be a blood donor. A couple of fun facts is that Denmark actually reports the highest blood donation rate. So if anybody on this webinar is from Denmark, well done. Keep up the good work. And as of May 2019, the right here in my backyard in London, uh, the West End Blood Donor Center was the busiest in the EU, collecting 60,000 units of blood that year. So donor retention is critical to maintain our country's blood supply for donation. This is also an area where we need um, quick throughput, so we don't want somebody coming in having a bad experience or taking too long as well, because donor retention, they tend to not come back if they have a bad experience. This is also an area where blood, assessing the actual blood flow of different veins and the vascular dimension, so how wide is that vein, we need to be choosing wide enough and vessels that flow well for proper needle placement because we want to avoid any nerve damage. We know that in some cases we can, especially after chronic donation, some of these donors do experience nerve damage because we're using the same vein over and over and over and over and over again. Every time we puncture a vein, we destroy it just a little bit more. It builds up a little scar tissue. It can become hardened. We, we see this in chronic uh, like cancer patients and so forth. So we want to minimize the damage that we're doing on these blood vessels for otherwise healthy people. And of course, patient satisfaction is, a, is, is, is key in this because you want your people to come back to donate. 
So how can near infrared specifically influence these type of donors? Well, like we said earlier, you can um, locate alternate veins because typically if anybody works in blood donation, somebody walks in and they say, oh, this is a good vein, my, my right antecubital, this is the one that the nurses always use. So we tend to default to the one that's always used. However, there might be dozens of other veins that could be quite viable. And if we could do site rotation, every time these people come in, we can give the veins a lot, a more a higher optimal chance of healing in between insults, needle insults. Because I can assess bifurcations, I can also assess my optimal vein segments. I can detect any hematomas. So if we have an old donor site or if you have a donor that comes in that happens to bruise easily, you'll be able to see that and you can avoid those areas. And we can you know, increase the number of donors that are coming in with our increased efficiencies with faster phlebotomies, better samples, you know, less risk of uh, red blood cell lysis. We're getting, we're getting better bags of blood. So all in all, the, using a device like this is quite helpful for our donors, but also our staff. This is a quick little snippet of what you can expect if you do a blood draw with vein viewer and you were going to actually shine the light down. Now, obviously this is a syringe, this is a syringe technique. So this wouldn't necessarily be what you would see in a blood donation site, but I want you to pay attention to this segment of vein where the end of this catheter is lying. You can see as the vein refills with blood, it's a lot easier to see. As the clinician aspirates, the vein actually disappears. So this is another example of that real-time imaging where you can actually track what the vessel is doing and where the blood is going. Now, unfortunately, near-infrared technology is not widely used in blood donation because this is an area where we tend to think we have large, juicy antecubital vessels. The clinicians are always very good at their jobs. I mean, doing phlebotomies 24 seven, you become very, very proficient. However, the research shows us something a little bit different. So we need, I just wanna add another layer to our thought process where we might think it's not really needed for these patients or for these donors, but you know, the research has shown that when vein visualization technology, vein viewer is used, 58% of donors say they would actually redonate if vein view or vein visualization technology was used in their particular blood center. Among the new donors, it actually jumps up to 70% say that they would redonate if you were to use something like vein viewer. Um, clinicians have said that, that, that vein visualization significantly is more useful when the vein is obviously not visible to the naked eye. So a fun fact is the human eye can see about three millimeters into the body, whereas again, the vein viewer sees about 10. So you're going to have a lot more options. It's almost like you get Superman or Superwoman vision and you have all these other options to choose from. And again, the staff actually rated it useful in 71% of these donations. So although we're, we might not have a lot of exposure to this technology in this area, it's definitely something that is helpful and our colleagues find useful as well as our donors. One of our case studies that this one, this one happened to be done in the US, but we looked at a lifeblood service, which is a large blood service in um, America. And we did a quick case study where we looked at 29 donors that were previously turned away because they actually could not get their, their blood draw. They couldn't get a, access to, to draw their blood. So of these 29 donors, we called them, this, this uh, blood center called them all back in and they wanted to see if vein viewer could help. And with the vein viewer, every single one of these patients was able to donate blood after using the vein viewer. And simply because you could actually see the veins now, whereas before the clinicians couldn't see or palpate a good enough vein. And here's a couple of uh, examples down here, before and after, before it's pretty, pretty impossible to see anything, but then the vein viewer at least shows a small segment near the AC that you could assess. Again, please don't change your technique. We still, again, if you're still going to warm compress because somebody comes in cold or you're going to use a tourniquet, please continue to do these things. 
Um, the near infrared technology is actually a recommended guideline, a global recommended guideline. I'm not sure if we all knew this or not. It is fairly new. Only a couple of years have different uh, global regular, not regulatory, global, global um, thought leader or medical bodies have really started to recommend this. But the EFLM even collaborated with the uh, Colabio, which is a Latin American uh, a society to actually write guidelines around near infrared technology and blood donation. Now, guidelines are based in research. So if you have publishing bodies that recommend global best practices or guidelines, it's not someone's opinion on if you should, if you want to. These guidelines are always rooted in evidence. So these bodies, their entire job is to study the research and make best practice guidelines for what we should be doing out in the real world. So guidelines should not be taken lightly. This again, isn't somebody's opinion at the hospital down the street. This is based in multiple, multiple uh, people's research and work and what their outcomes have been. And so these guidelines are built around vein visualization. So we should be using as an obligatory technology, according to the guidelines, we should be using near infrared to locate the veins and in some cases, maybe even instead of using tourniquets, because we're able to see veins without a tourniquet, we might even be able to minimize the risk of venostasis, especially if, you know, maybe you've got a long blood draw going on, a long donor sitting there in the chair for a long time. It's especially useful in difficult veins. And um, by potentially not using a tourniquet, we also might be able to, you know, reduce the risk of the coagulation in during the blood procedure because you have potentially better blood flow and so forth. So this kind of gives you an alternative to maybe your everyday regular standard practice. If you really do look into the guidelines and recommendations, you can find a few more sources that actually say we should be using this for blood donors. The Royal College of Nursing here in the UK puts out a nursing workforce standards and in one of their standards they talk about how newer clinicians should always be trained in to be proficient at their skills and technologies before actually turning them out on patients and the european pharmaceutical review also recommends that near infrared light should be used especially with difficult patients in order to be able to see those anacubitals for blood donations so there's quite a few guidelines out there telling us what we should be doing based in research but there's a big gap on what's actually happening. So there's a huge educational prospect for us across Europe. There's a gap where we can actually achieve these guidelines, but it's not widely accepted yet. And I wanna stress that on today's time together is that we should be using tools that not only make our lives easier, but ultimately I believe we're all in healthcare because we wanna make people's lives better. We don't want to inflict any unnecessary pain on people, right? And so we got into healthcare and being a clinician, typically because we wanna do right by people and help people. So this gap that we have is part of our job and our responsibility to be better to our donors. So this educational opportunity is, is I, would, I would bet is available in your country. I would bet that if you walked into any blood donation site uh, in any country ac across Europe, Vein visualization is probably not wide, widely used, but if you are in this area of medicine, you have a large opportunity to be a benchmark and to be a global leader in taking your center into the future for blood donation. Here in the UK, the NHS blood and transplant kind of figured this out a couple of years ago, and they use the vein viewer specifically to help train their phlebotomists. So before a phlebotomist is turned out, to practice on patients, they're actually trained with the vein viewer from the start on how to be better at finding veins for our donors. A direct quote from them is that these scanners will help the trainees to understand the structure of the veins. So it's interesting that they say to understand the structure of the veins. They aren't saying just to understand where to find one, but essentially where to find the best one. And I'll wrap with this. I recently learned this year that because of the pandemic, half of our donors that are donate, I'm sorry, half of donors that would normally donate blood 
are actually do donating less because of the pandem pandemic. And this is European wide. So you can imagine we've been in lockdown for many, many months in, in different areas, more months than others. And people were not either able to or they were afraid to go and donate blood. And these are a lot of people who are regular donors, but half of them aren't doing that anymore, which means when our countries start opening up, and our hospitals start opening up to elective surgeries, um, taking in more patients for procedures that they might need. The demand for blood hasn't gone down. The demand for whole blood and so and uh, and so forth has remained the same. And we may even see a spike in the upcoming months as people are coming in more and more for surgeries and procedures that have been put off for 12 months. So the demand is there, but the supply is not. So we may be facing. Uh, somewhat of a, I don't want to call it a crisis, but we may be facing uh, somewhat of a situation, a precarious situation, let's call it that, where we won't have enough blood for the people who need it. So it's critical that we're calling in people from around the world to donate. So I'll leave you with this, that if you, if you are a blood donor, please go donate blood and then ask them to use Vein Viewer if you do go. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> So finally, let's move on to modernizing aesthetics using near infrared. Completely different cohort of people. These are cosmetic procedures that people usually come in and they are paying out of pocket for. This typically involves Botox and different types of injectables like hyaluronic acid and so forth and vein treatment procedures such as sclerotherapy or, or spider veins in the legs, varicose veins, which can also be quite painful. So the vein viewer is used for both different types of situations, both cosmetic injectables and vein procedures. So let's start about talking about the injectables, the Botoxes and um, different types of fillers. So this is an area where you know, I, I always say the vein viewer will show you all the veins and can help you assess their behaviors. What you do with that vein is totally up to you. So for cos cosmetic injectables, we tend to use this for vein avoidance. So we want to know where the vein is at. So I don't put any Botox or filler inside the bloodstream, right? So this is where we can map it and avoid it. You can map any part of the body. This is safe to use around the eyes. It is just LED lights. There's no lasers or anything involved. So you can use this anywhere from head to toe, face to the legs for sclerotherapy, and it will map all the veins for you. This will decrease your bruising and hematomas. You know, if anybody's gone in for any injectables, if you, you know, nick the vein, then you come out with bruises, which patients are not usually happy about that. You have a reduction in cost because you're you're managing your medications better. You're, you're maximizing utilization of the injectable. Obviously, this improves the patient experience. It also is a great, a lot of our doctors find it to be a great marketing tool. If you went on Instagram and just looked at Vein Viewer, most doctors posting uh, are about their private practices and drawing clients in because they have the most modern technology. There's a reduction in downtime and of course patient referral is key. If someone has a good experience, they refer their friends and that's how physicians gain their clientele. So one of the things that vein viewer does because we can avoid these veins is it helps us avoid complications. This is an example of a woman who went in for some fillers in the face and some of it accidentally got into one of the veins uh, in her cheek around the cheek area and she had an adverse reaction of course to this type of filler. Nobody wants this to happen to them and when you use vein visualization technology, you can very quick, quickly and very easily avoid these type of complications that we haven't been able to avoid before this technology was introduced into the market. Like I said earlier, for specifically to Botox, there are, um, you know, the evidence also points to using this type of technology for, for Botox injections. Like I said, you can use it to map you can actually use the device when you actually inject, or you could map the veins with a body pen and completely turn the light off. 
again, knowing for sure where the veins are so you can avoid them. And um, many physicians use this in order. You can see a quote from Dr. Miyake on the right. He works out of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's a, he's a world renowned um, a phlebologist who uses this for both injectables and sclerotherapy. And he, you know, he says you don't waste time. You more efficiently use your Botox and of course the patients are happier. This is just a little example of a patient before and after using vein viewer, what you can see before, what you can see after. You can see on her face, because we tend to think, well, the, you know, that we don't have a lot of layers of, you know, sub Q on the face. So you should be able to see a lot of them. But that's quite a misnomer because you can see clearly even on this woman's face, her vessels are either invisible or very, very difficult to see. Whereas the vein viewer shows you a myriad of highways and byways of veins that are actually in her face that we should be avoiding. So let's move on to vein treatment procedures. Vein treatment procedures would be any type of procedure where you're doing sclerotherapy or you're treating varicose veins. These are typically in the legs, although they can be anywhere and can be quite painful and can actually be a medical condition in some cases. And in some areas around Europe, um, I believe this is even something that's covered under the healthcare systems if it's become a medical problem. The nice thing about using vein viewer technologies for vein treatment procedures is you can actually see what you're doing as you're doing it. So it gives you confidence and real time assessment of your actual treatment while you're doing it. There's no surprises. So as you are injecting, you can see the clearing of the blood column as evidenced in this video here. What you're seeing there is not the actual um, the sclerosant, you're seeing the displacement of the blood. So remember this device only likes blood. But if you move that blood around, the vein viewer is gonna show you where it's moving. So as you inject, you're seeing that blood column being cleared by whatever you're putting in. The same applies when you flush with a saline or you flush with anything else, you're going to be able to see that in real time, which means I can assess all of the problematic veins. So many times for scleral procedures, we might treat the telangiosis, so we might treat all the tiny spider veins, but underneath there's a bigger feeder vein feeding those tiny veins, and these patients have to come back multiple times. So because I can visualize this procedure in real time, and I can maximize this sclerosant agent, I can track exactly where it's going, I can actually see better on, I, I, can, I can see more clearly on exactly what I'm doing to this patient and hopefully reduce the amount of times that they come in. <clears throat> Many times these webbings of vessels that need to be essentially ablated are quite webbed. They're webbed and they're convoluted and it's very hard to tell which way the blood is going. Up, down, left, right, in, out. It's very hard to tell. And that's why tracking the mapping and the blood flow as you milk the vein is also critically important. Um, we will talk about assessing the feeder veins in a couple more slides here, which is a very important thing in sclerotherapy and how the vein viewer helps, but I also can avoid infiltration. So if I know that I'm in the vein and I'm injecting, I need to know I'm in the vein and I'm not in the tissue as well. And because this is a real-time image, you can, be, you can have the confidence knowing you're actually injecting in the right space and not into like the interstitial or the structures around the vein. This is an example of a sclerose, sclerosing or uh, sclerotherapy, sorry, sclerotherapy procedure where the light is actually used. So this speaks to medication, proper medication management and being a good steward of our pharmacologies. So as you track the injection up the leg, you can see where it goes and also where it stops. And you can see that the results there, the vein is actually closed. As you track the agent up the leg, you can see how far the ablation occurs and where you would need to inject next, which obviously maximizes the procedure and exposes the patient to less pharmacology, right? We always want to do the most with the less, uh, least invasive that we can do. There is a physician by the name of Dr. Miyake, 
in Brazil who has pioneered something called the CLAX procedure. And the CLAX procedure is a three, it's a tri, it's a threefold, I'll call it a threefold patented procedure. Dr. Miyake even hosts his own Miyake University in Sao Paulo, where physicians from all over the world come in to study this procedure. They get certified and they can go back to their respective countries to practice this. This involves using the vein viewer, a cryolaser, and sclerotherapy for better improved outcomes for uh, varicose veins. His entire ethos is targeting what we call the feeder vein. So if you imagine a tree and the roots of that tree are feeding the big tree trunk, right? If you just keep cutting off all the branches of the tree, eventually the branches will grow back season after season. If you really, really wanted to stop the tree from spreading, you'd have to cut it down at the roots, right? And it's the same concept with these feeder veins. If I just keep treating all the tiny spider veins, well, those spider veins are being fed from somewhere, and usually it's what Dr. Miyake calls the feeder vein. So you have to almost, for lack of better words, you have to kill the feeder vein in order to really treat the disease. If you don't, these tiny veins will either pop back open after a period of time, or as we know, the body is quite dynamic. So if the feeder vein is still there, our body will still create collateral veins over time, and the problem will come back in a new form. So in order to treat this for a, uh, for a long-term solution, we need to be attacking the feeder vein. However, the feeder veins are a lot deeper. Sometimes they're very difficult to find, assess, and palpate with just our naked eyes. And because the vein viewer is dynamic and can see deeper into the body, that is why the vein viewer is integrated as an essential piece of technology to the CLAX procedure, because the vein viewer can find the feeder vein, and then you can use a cryo, excuse me, cryo laser to ablate it, as well as sclerosin to get all of the telangiectasies that have come off the feeder vein. Dr. Miyake has been doing this for over a decade. Dr. Miyake actually helped develop the first ever Christie vein viewer. So he has a lot of data and research showing his outcomes by using this type of technology. He's found that in his practice over the last decade, he's had a reduction in 26% uh, reduction in his mean number of procedures, which you might think, if, it, if, if my practice depends on my patients, but I'm doing 26% less of these type of patients, that means I'm seeing less people. But in the opposite side of the spectrum, because he started using this technology, his rise in referrals went up by 20%. Remember, these are people coming in that would normally maybe have to come back every two, three, four months because the problem kept arising. This is a doctor that's figured out how to permanently, long-term, eradicate the problem by using Bainviewer. So his referral rate has actually gone up and he has a very busy, busy practice. Obviously, his patient satisfaction has increased by evidenced by his rise in referrals, and he's had zero complications over the course of 10 years by using near infrared to integrate it into his practice. It's a safe method to use on any, any one of his patients. At this point, I'd like to thank again, Griner for hosting this webinar today. I feel very honored to be able to share this with you. And Nick, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Sarah. That was that was very interesting. Thank you for, for taking the time to do that. Uh, we have had a few questions, um, which we'll, we'll run through now. Um, so the first question is, how do you deal with very small neonates um, when in an incubator with the vein viewer? What if it's not possible to shine the flex on the skin? That's a that's a very tricky one. Um, in my own, I'm going to just tell you from my own practice, you know, practicing on neonates, I always say to myself, at least, I eventually have to open up that isolate to start the IV, right? You usually have to open it up somehow. So if I I kind of weigh, weigh the the risk and the reward, the risk, the benefit, right? So if I say if I can quickly put the flex into the incubator and use to quickly assess, it's probably better for that particular patient than me manipulating that infant for 12 to 15 minutes trying to find a vein. But I do wanna tell you, you need to base your judgment on the fragility of your patient. So if I have a very a 24 week neonate who's very unstable and in an isolate and really can't be exposed to open air, 
I might have to, in that case, forfeit using VeinViewer because the risk to the patient could be higher. So this isn't a technology, you have to use your own clinical judgment. So although we would love to use this on every patient, in some cases, it might not be appropriate. Just like any other devices or technology, there's not a one-stop shop for everybody. But if you can weigh the risk and benefit to potentially opening the incubator for a brief couple of minutes, maybe you do a pre-assessment and you see something viable, and then you grab the vein viewer very quickly to confirm that it's viable, no, no bifurcations, no valves, and then you have that 100% assurance and you're not exposing the baby to you know, open air or so forth. Um, but you'd have to kind of weigh those situations individually. Okay, that's great, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is um, regarding the throughput times in a blood donor center. And the question is, do, does the um, does this benefit? Um, sorry, does the benefit of vein viewer assessment outweigh potential delay in time delay um, to times the throughput times? Yes. So yes, it does benefit the through the throughput times. Any type of tool, I you know, we believe that any type of tool that is faster, better, quicker for the patients and safe is best, right? So when we're using vein viewer, because we can do a very quick assessment, you know, you immediately turn it on and you immediately see, I'm not messing with tourniquets, I'm not palpating, I'm not trying to search. Very quickly, the vein shows up right there before your very eyes and you can make a very quick assessment, allowing you for quicker access and quicker needle placement to draw your blood. In addition, I think one of the bigger factors as well, not just finding that vein, but finding a good vein. We have to use larger needles for blood donors, right? So you're going to need a vein width diameter or vein real estate, as I like to call it, that will give you adequate blood flow. I mean, how many times do we have donors come in and the, do the actual flow of the donation slows down? So we start manipulating stuff. We manipulate the bag, we manipulate the arm. We need, if we're choosing better veins to start, bigger, what I just call bigger, juicier veins that it can accommodate those larger bore needles, we have faster actual donor time in the chair because we're not having to troubleshoot. And we know with repeat donors, we get to know our donors. So we get to know what their issues are. We get to know what their favorite vein is and they're this and they're that, right? So if I know someone's coming in and I have typical maybe some hiccups with this donor, then I can potentially use the vein viewer to mitigate some of those hiccups. Not to mention patients really do love it. I mean, you turn the light on, it's just, this isn't clinical, but it's just, it's a fun device for people, for our donors and for our patients. They can see inside their body. They, you know, there's always that wow factor, which also decreases anxiety and calls your donors back in as well. They want to come back to this center. And even if you miss your blood donation on the first try, or you miss your first IV, you've at least shown your client or your patient that you've used everything you possibly can to help make their experience better, which will hopefully, you know, just as that study shown, you know, 70% of donors said they would redonate if you just use the technology on them. They didn't say, if you only stick me once, I'll come back. They said, if you just use this technology, 70% of us would come back. So you can imagine as you're going to get more people donating too, you're going to really need to increase those throughput efficiencies. Great, thank you very much. And the, the, the final question touches on the third part of, of the webinar. Um, and the question is, uh, what can go wrong in a Botox injection if veins uh, are not correctly assessed? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few complications that arise. If you can imagine what whatever you're going to be injecting into the body, you want it to go to the right place, just as a general rule of thumb, right? We don't want it to end up at the wrong address. So when, for instance, Botox, if you are injecting Botox into, into like the vein, you can get abnormal swelling. You have, you know, this neurotoxin that's now in the bloodstream. It's not in the place that it's supposed to be. I think probably the higher complications would be your fillers. If you get some of those larger molecule fillers, like hyaluronic acid or so forth, into the bloodstream, you have complications such as the photo that I showed you, a lot of swelling. The veins, you know, a lot of times these are not, they're caustic. They're not, they're not supposed to be in the fragile blood vessels. So when they do get in there, the vein and the body reacts. You have an immune response. Um, 
in extreme situations, I mean, you've seen people, I've, I think maybe we've probably all seen people that might get fillers, ends up in the wrong place, it hardens and they have to be like a either not a full surgery, but even in the offices, it has pieces of these fillers and things that can harden have to be removed later. So it's critical when you're doing these procedures up front that we're putting whatever we're putting in the body, that it's going to the right space, whether that's in the vein, like vein treatment procedures, I want to know that that sclerosant is going in the vein or whether we want to avoid the vein. I don't want something like Botox or filler to go into that vein. Okay, thank you very much. And, and that's the end of the questions. And that marks the end of um, today's webinar. Um, I'd like to thank Sarah for taking the time to, to present to, to us. It's been very, very interesting. And if anyone watching wants to know more about vein viewer they can contact us at faq.pa at gbo.com or visit our website we'd really love to hear from you um and on that note um I, i'll draw the webinars to a conclusion thank you very much